Welcome back. I am some guy you've never heard of, and this is Pathfinder Kingmaker, the Chronicle of Arya Cyril. Alright, let's follow the cultists. It is done. The triumph over the wicked Lamash to cultists proved incomplete. Some villain or villainous had swept, slipped away under the cover of darkness and into a narrow gorge amongst the rocks. Without a second thought, our brave baron, loyal Keston, and their comrades in arms rushed after the fleeing figure. The figure, clad in black, was barely visible in the dark. The villain had gotten far ahead of us. At the last moment, the Baron noticed their prey had turned aside and disappeared behind the rocks. Let's see, Dexterity 17. Need a 12 or better. Mobility 21. You'd need a 5 or better. Um, let's see. After they decided after they decided to take a shortcut to catch the cultist by surprise, the party started climbing up the stone ridge. Climbing in the darkness is a difficult task, it's not a joke, when you try to catch a stable rock and hear the small stones crumble under your feet. Several times it seemed our heroes were out of luck, but their stubbornness and the thought of the runaway cultists gloating about eluding them gave them strength. Moments later we were at the top. Why is it dark? We went here at like the beginning of the day. So our heroes found themselves at the top, and just in time. The cultist, barely visible in the darkness, was threading his way through the gorge directly beneath them. It seemed the cultist was so focused on finding his footing, he didn't notice his pursuers perched above him, giving the Baron a chance to strike. What will our heroes do next? Let's see. Why would it be me for strength? I've got a Miri. <laughs> Why don't we just attack? I'm an archer. Almost everyone's got at least one ranged spell. I mean, I, I fire my bows. Lindsay fires her bolts. Amiri pops off a lightning bolt. Octavia throws a fireball. Um, Tristian throws a fireball. I would think that'd be sufficient. I guess I'll do the dexterity one since I have better chance at that one. Um, or send the swiftest, most agile ahead down the unstable slope in hopes of cutting the runway off. Arrows! Oh, I actually get to choose the character. Okay. We do the strength one. of an avalanche over the run runaway's head. Okay, that's 19 there. What about this here? 20. Okay, so I actually have a slightly better chance at that. Yeah, I'll send the swiftest and most agile ahead down the unstable slope in the hopes of cutting the runway off. Um, yeah, that's gonna be me. Succeeded at a dexterity check. Arya Cyril appeared from the darkness like a spirit. The runaway clearly hadn't been expecting that. Arya Cyril barely had time to react when the cultist burst into a sprint. Darkness failed to cover the peculiar way the runaway walked. The robed figure was limping badly, dragging their right leg. Despite that, the cultists vanished into the darkness without a trace. The party be followed to the edge of the plateau where the flatlands began. 
As our brave heroes reached the edge of the plateau, the vastness of the Camelands opened before them, an ocean of high grass, as far as the eye could see. A beautiful sight, but finding our quarry in this ocean, in this green sea, it would prove impossible. Yeah, except you just have to keep an eye out for movement. Um, with our heads down and hopes lost, we descended to where a small streamlet flowed amongst the stones, and then, there before us, good fortune. In his haste, our villain had run through the high grass, leaving a trail for all to see. Yeah! The party immediately set off, driven by a single desire, to capture the criminal who dared to escape the punishment of the Baron, and had led us on this unwelcome chase. We moved as swiftly as we could, but even the ground seemed to fight us. Rock gave way to mud, mud which grew deeper as we marched on and seemed to grab at our boots. Even the wind began to rise, lashing at our cloaks, and a foul scent filled the air. Sure signs we were heading towards the Norrell Marches. Soaking wet and exhausted, our heroes came upon a cabin at the edge of the swamp. According to Keston, it was a hunter's lodge, owned by Do Dumra, a hunter who lived there alone, and was known for her great temper and little patience. Oh, we met her. It also looked as if it might take a place take it might be a place where the cultist would seek shelter. It was unlikely the runaway would brave the depths of the Gnarl Marches in the middle of the night. So the Baron pushed open the door and stepped inside letting a touch of the cool night air in. Right. The lodge is lit with only a few candles on the table and the counter. Shadows lie thick around the room. A number of people are here. Well dressed, a well-dressed couple at one of the tables, a girl in simple dress, dozes near the opposite wall. And at the counter is an untidy dwarf. She's wiping the mugs and glaring at you. From the half-open kitchen door, you hear the clanging of pans upon metal. Presumably a stove. Keston looks around with a heavy gaze. Things have gone from bad to worse. We must find the cultists before they flee. We have no idea what they look like. The people in the lodge look surprised and concerned. Each seems to recognize you and asks themselves, What is the ruler of these lands doing here at such a late hour? Flanked by armed guards. Keston's hand falls to his weapon. Your grace, I'm ready to make an arrest, but if you wish to investigate further before making a decision, I'll make sure no one leaves the lodge until you give the order. Yep, I'd like to look around and speak with, the pe with these people. Maybe I'll find something. I mean, dude's wounded, so there we go. As you command, your grace, no one will leave this house. I'll make sure of it, of that. Keston looks around the hall once again. My advice? Take their room keys. Their personal belongings speak their owner's intents, often more than their masters would like. Oh. Okay then. Now I'm actually supposed to, like, check people's stuff. I did as you asked. Alright, what do we got in here? <clears throat> the sheets are crumpled, the blanket is thrown aside. It seems someone was sleeping in this bed not long ago. Alright, what's in this chest here? Anything else? Let's see, a cloak? What kind of a cloak? Resistance plus two. No stopping now. Alright, what's going on in this room? From the look of it, nothing. Well, there's a chest, I'm though. Sorry. I've broken a nail! It won't work! And Lindsay was called forth. No, she was called Lindsay. I have never once called her forth. Ready and willing. Wow. Well. That's a really locked chest. If none of my folks can open it. Applause, please. Applause, please. Onwards. Anything else? 
The chest contains modest clothing, some packed leftover food, a purse with herbs and other personal belongings. That was easy. The mattress covers bloodstained cloth and bandages. This is Olika's bed. Okay, we'll assume it's Olika then. But perhaps I should talk to some people first. Um, Cab... Let's see. Cabron Tedrim. A bearded middle-aged man stands before you. He wears a massive gold chain on his neck. The woman beside him gives him a polite smile and nod, and a nod as you approach. Greetings, Baron. The man's voice is so low as to rumble. Let me introduce myself. Cabron Tedrim from Restov. He nods to the woman beside him. This is my wife, Una Tedrim. We've come to your lands to hunt, yet I admit we did not expect to meet you in person. To what do we owe this honor? A crime has taken place nearby. The one responsible may be hiding in this house. Have you seen anything suspicious? Tedrim exchanges glances. I'm afraid, your, your grace... We won't be able to help you. Now, do you recall who came to the lodge in the last hour or so? On second thought, this young woman, I didn't notice exactly when she entered the room. He turns to his wife. My dear, perhaps you recall? What was the name of our host used addressing her? Olika, sweetheart. I cannot recall if I saw her at the start of the evening. All right. Let's go back to the other questions. I need your room. I need the a key to your room. No, I'm not gonna do that. Alright. Um, we'll come back to you later. Thank you. A young woman stands before you wearing a plain dress and a hooded cloak. Her belly is swollen. She is pregnant, and her time is near. The woman manages a bow. I've heard other people calling you Baron, Your Grace. It's an honor to be in your presence. I am Olika. Um, what are you doing here? I'm taking what rest I can after a long day on the road, Your Grace. I'm a widow. Olika stops short. I've barely had two seasons to mourn my husband. And he left me with child, and in difficult times like these. I've got a sister in Ralton, God's bless her. She's agreed to give me shelter in her house. So I went there. There was nowhere else to go. Alright, are you planning to stay in Ralton? I don't know yet, she answers. But if things turn out well, why not? Where are you from? From Galt, Your Grace. I'm from a tiny village near the tract. Guess no one ever heard about this place. You recall the location of Galt and Grawl and Gralton. As far as you know, stolen lands lay aside from places Olika had named. So it wouldn't make sense to be traveling to Gralton from Galt through the sto stolen lands. All right, it was a long journey for you. I have little coin, Your Grace, so I have to beg traders on the road for ride, to ride in their carts. I spend nights anywhere I have to. This place is at least warm and dry. All right, let's talk about something else. Um, I'm looking for a cultist of a dark goddess. Can you help me? Cultist? That's, that's horrible, but how can I help you? Have you seen anything suspicious tonight? No, I don't think so. Um, do you know anyone in this hall? First time I've seen these people was when I stepped over the threshold of this lodge. Okay. Do you know who came to the lodge last? I heard a noise from the kitchen. It was like something fell on the floor, and then this grumpy old lady, Dumra, came out. Okay, well, Dumra is... We call it. Olika, why are there blood stained undergarments in your room? What is that? Where is that from? 
Alika takes a step back, her eyes wide with fear. I'll, I'll explain. The woman lowers her head and rests her hands against her belly. I'm expecting a baby, but because of the journey or all of the worries, something must have gone wrong. It hurts. Alika closes her eyes tightly, and I bleed. Alika starts sobbing. I tried. I tried to find out what's wrong, to heal myself, to appease the gods. The priest of Pharasma told me he couldn't help. The goddess rejected my child, said it would be born dead. But I can't. I can't just accept it. I can't give up. This child, my husband's child, all I have left of him. Alika hides her face behind her hands and starts to weep. You realize you'll get nothing more from her at the moment. Alright, so you're in the middle of a miscarriage. Um, so you're in the middle of the of a miscarriage, and uh, you have motive to be worshipping Lamash too, maybe she'll give you a baby. Alright, who's this? Sana. The kitchen servant is busy, grinding herbs with a mortar. She's wearing a dress, soiled with dark stains, and her hair is knotted in a bun, with a few stray hairs poking free. There's no kitchen servant here. Hearing your footsteps, the woman raises her head and looks at you. Need something, do you? Hmm. Yeah, we're looking for a criminal who may have fled this way. Have you seen anyone suspicious? What can be seen here, you say? Sana snorts. Ask Tumra. She runs the house. She does. Alright, the hostess of the lodge doesn't mind you cooking at her kitchen. As if she came here or ought came here often herself. She throws up her hands. Filth piled in corners, the floor, sandals deep in dirt. I had to work my fingers to bones to clean the kitchen before I could start a proper meal in this, this cow shed. Alright, well that's all I need, thank you. So, who are you anyway? My name's Sana. I cook for Tedrims, nobles from Restov. She wipes her hands with her apron. What will it be? Um... What can you tell me about your masters? No quicker road to trouble, talking about masters, that is. She glances at your clothes and sighs. How would you like it if your servants were all a gossip about you? They pay regular, not stingy with their coin. They don't yell much. So I count myself fortunate, I do. Alright. Alright, I have to go. Thank you. Okay, what did that journal update say? Hey, we meet again, Dumra. Uh, I'm looking for someone. Can you help me? Duma gives you a sullen glance. It seems she's not too happy to talk with you, but she doesn't dare refuse it openly. A cultist of Lamashtu is hiding in your lodge. I have to find them. Duma stares at you for a moment, then utters a hoarse chuckle. One of Lamashtu's own? That's quite a story you've spun, Your Grace. Next you'll tell me I'm holding... Rovagog down in the cellar. And what's your proof that I hide cultists? I never said you hide them! I didn't accuse you of anything. I'm not going to argue with you. Do you know who your guests are? Why should I? I'm not their ward. They come, they pay for a bed, they keep quiet. Why would I care who they are? Okay. I don't know why I keep seeing that word being used incorrectly in places. The ward is the person being warded. Not the one doing the warding. Technically, that would be a warden. Of course, you're not their ward, because you're the one who owns the house. If anything, they're your wards. Do you remember when they came to your lodge last? Let's see, I went to check on my traps. Some people arrived when I was away, so I can't tell you for sure, Your Grace. Alright, fine. Let's go back to my other questions. I have to go. Alright, Cabron, 
tell me about yourself, please. I'm a legalist, Baron. My job is to ensure Restov's laws are upheld. My wife is a keeper of the hearth and my loyal companion in prolonged journeys. Una nods without a word, her gaze fixed on you. Oh, sure. Oh, yes, of course, Cabrin Tedrum. I've heard about you and your famous legal cases. Cabron Tedrum freezes as if someone put a knife to his throat. Is, is that so? He tries to smile, but his eyes are fearful. I doubt, Baron, that anything you heard concerned me. My family name is a common one. I'm... I have so many relatives, I know not a quarter of them. He clears his throat. Well, with a difficult job like yours, it's impossible to get by without some divine support. Whom do you address your prayers to? Why, to Abadar, of course. Divine patron of law and lawmakers. And lawyers, I mean. Cabron looks at you intently. Surely you are aware of Ar Abadar, are you? Are you not? You must be. No matter. No matter. Let's go back to other questions. Why can't I ask them about their servant? You recognized me at once. Do I know you? I doubt it. But news about developments within the Stolen Lands and your role in them has traveled far, Arius, Arius Cyril. is a well-known name beyond your borders. Okay. Well, I need a key to your room. Despite Una's cool expression, you notice a bead of sweat running down her temple. As she spots your, grave, your glance, her lips tight. Um, as you wish, Baron. Alright, I'll come back later. Thank you. Man, all these people look suspicious. Seem suspicious. <clears throat> Let's just arrest everyone. And then there we go. All right, I'm going back upstairs. Okay, so this is his room. There wasn't really like, oh, there we go, Tedrum's Done. chest. There are no hunting bows, arrows, snares, nor any signs of the Tedrums having any hunting on their mind. Okay. Great. No stopping now. Um, hey, Tsana, I need the, the key to your room. Room? She raises an eyebrow. I don't have a room, except here in the kitchen. Bed's a bench. Still warm enough, though. Okay, what are you cooking? That there's for tomorrow. She says, hey, it's tomorrow's midday meal, it is. Okay. Let's peek into the stew pot. You take the lid off the pan. Some brew boils inside. It looks strange and smells odd. You lean over. Smell the stew. And immediately flinch. The acrid stink of vinegar feels like a punch in the face. Besides, you can smell some strange spice, which would be appropriate in a dessert, but not in a first course for dinner. Alright, I won't trouble you any longer. Let's check the kitchen stove here. Something is burning inside the stove. It was thrown in the fire not long ago. Wow. 
why don't we just to rest everyone? All right, Jumra, I'm sorry. I gotta talk to you some more here. All right, how many people are, are there in the lodge now except for you? Watch yourself. There are three of them, all sitting over there. Dumra nods towards her guests. That one in the kitchen guessing she's a servant of those two noble folk. They look to be carrying all the coin. All right, well, I'd like to examine your room, Dumra. Dumra hands tighten to fists, but she keeps them on her hips. She says nothing, merely stares at you defiantly. Listen, the sooner I cross you out of the suspect list, the sooner I leave you alone. Do me a favor, give me your room key, and this will all be over before you know it. Yeah, I'll be diplomatic. I won't intimidate. Jumra is silent for a moment and nods and pulls an old, age darkened key from her belt. Your way then, she, her eyes narrows, but have a care. No digging through my undergarments or I'll have your hands on hooks, you hear? Alright. Got it. It is done. Which room is her? Follow me. Here I am. See. Sorry, I wasn't trying to click on you, um, Amiri. Stopping now. Done and done. I see something. Pile of dirty clothes covers some snares. There are a few hunting bows and quivers with arrows. All right. What's this here? Bunch of. I'm not just going to take her gold. Okay. What's this here? The sheets on this bed look dirty. The old bed cover is sewed together from a number of patches. Okay. What's this here? Receipts, shopping lists, and other papers pile over Dumra's table. All right. Nope, nothing suspicious in there. Hmm. Talk to Una Tedrum. No, I was actually specifically trying to. Now I can finally ask the woman in your in the kitchen. Your cook. Cabron nods quickly. Yes, we we just can't imagine our lives without Sana. Una coughs delic delicately. My constitution demands a unique diet. She studies you closely. A private matter, if you don't mind. All right, I've been to your room. I found no hunting weapons there. Erm, um, you see, well, she licks his lips, which are now trembling slightly. Una, who was watching her husband closely, touches his shoulder lightly. I beg your pardon, Baron. She leans in to Cabron and whispers something in his ear. His wife's gentle support have had an almost enchanting effect on Cabron. He suddenly straightens and smiles himself as if nothing happened. Truth be told, it's a rather embarrassing matter. I proved a much worse hunter than I thought. Just imagine, I managed to snap not one, not two, but three bow strings in a day. Infuriated, I broke my bow across my knee. It shames me to even speak of it. Um. Far from Ribavoy, are you not? You see, Erm... Um, 
I've heard the wildlife here is an excellent sport, so I decided to see for myself. Sort... Sort truth from rumor, you understand. Fortunately, my fair wife was in favor of the trip, so here we are. Do you prefer snares or a bow? Erm, um, a bow. Okay, what kind of prey do you hunt? I, uh, cougars. Magnificent predators, worthy prey for a worthy hunter. Alright, well, I hope you enjoy your hunting. Let's change the topic. An odd place to rest for the night. Why, Baron, when it gives a false smile, we adore this charming dwelling. She glances around the dim hall. Her smile remains, but you notice she raises her eyebrows at her surroundings, as if in judgment. Alright, I'll come back to you later. Alright, Olika, I need a key to your room. She hesitates, then takes the key out of her cloak and hands it to you without a word. Alright, you see this couple at the table? They're nobles from Restov. They claim you were the last one who'd come to the hall. Well, it gives you a perplexed look. But that's not true, it's not. Dumra, the hostess, she was the last one. I remember her coming through the kitchen. Alright, I should go. Talk to Doomra once more. People say you came to the hall last. Right, she speaks slowly, as if keeping her temper. I went out to the kitchen when this clumsy gal has knocked over some of my pots. What of it? Alright, I have to go. Let's just arrest a lot of them. And have someone who's actually skilled at interrogation take care of this. Okay, what's in this barrel over here? Okay, interesting. Anything else in here? There's another door over here. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. Alright, custom. Alright, who would you interrogate first? Um, the hostess has been staring hate at us since we entered. Mind her. Alright. Uh, there's someone who seemed especially suspicious to me. Can I... Um, no, I've changed my mind. You can handle this better than I. As you command, your grace. Keston catches the eye of the dwarf at the counter. The hostess isn't pleased to see us. She obviously doesn't care for soldiers or the law. Let's begin with her. Get to the interrogation, Keston. Well, Dumra, it's time to tell the truth. What about? What uh, about what drives a gang of soldiers to break into homes in the middle of the night? Watch your tongue, cultist. Your act won't save you. Confess you worship wretched Lamashtu, and maybe the Baron will spare your painful... Cultist, are you mad? My faith lies with the Rastal, no other. Indeed. Odd to hear that from the hermit who prefers to live in beside the monsters of the Gnarl Marches. Or do you claim you know nothing about the Shrine of the Dark Goddess? Not in all my years have I been spoken to such. If you won't listen... Listen... If you won't listen... Then there, look, the one points to a grimy tablet over the fireplace. A bow and an arrow of a rastal. She takes a breath. As for this Lamashtu of yours, I know nothing about her and I don't want to. I admit that's clever. A rastal symbol where everyone can see it, pretending to worship the god of hunting. Keston turns back to Dumra. This is your last chance. Confess or else. All of a sudden, a loud noise comes from the kitchen. Keston turns surprised. What was that? Following his warrior instincts, he grabs a weapon. This bat prattle bores me. Death to the intruders. Who is it, Suna? To 
They just summoned a bunch of red caps. Oh, it is Suna. Okay. Cool. Um, Octav oh, Octavius first. Nice. Haste. Good job, Octavia. Artemiri, rage and attack Tsuma. Alright, we'll go attack Tsuna. Alright, self, shoot Tsuna. Enough, I yield. Stop, stop, I surrender, I surrender. The priestess of Lamashtu holds her hands over her bleeding wounds, moaning in pain. She raises the hem of her skirt and starts to wipe away the blood from her legs. Her right leg is covered with sores, oozing pus and yellow ichor. You, you and your minions, unleashed a blight across my lands. Because of you, monsters overrun the barony, and honest people fear to leave their homes. The priestess of Lamashtu shakes her head and tries to close her wound, moaning. That's nonsense. I've heard the stories about what's happening in your barony, human, but I have nothing to do with this. The Great Mother rules the monsters of this world, but if you had truly earned her wrath, your lands would be drowning in blood. No, Baron, you must look elsewhere to place blame. Lamashtu and her followers have nothing to do with your trouble or your troubles. Alright, tell me about the cult of Lamashtu, then. We are numerous and we are strong. The tribe of Lamashtu follows, followers grows every day, breeds and spreads over the lands of Golarion in search of places to create new packs. Have you allied with goblins and other creatures in the area? No, we have the same mistress, mistress but our, path, our paths to faith are different. Alright, where are the rest of the Lamashtu cultists hiding? Moon's face turns to stone. You cannot make me betray the children of the Great Mother. Torture me if you like. Lamashtu will grant me the strength to endure any pain you inflict upon me. What kind of rituals were you performing at the shrine? We prayed to Lamashtu. We asked for new offspring in the pack. We mated like wild animals, free of stupid prejudices. Priestess's lips curve in a grin. I'll spare you the details, human. Those like you are unable to accept the greatness of our ancient faith. Octavia, aren't you a merry bunch? Octavia giggles, waving her finger tauntingly at the priestess. But you know, Calistria's faithful have a lot of fun too. Just without the risk of growing a pair of tentacles in the process. Don't you dare compare your frivolous goddess to ours who is as old as the world itself. Your orgies are little more than entertainment for bored townsfolk. Ours are full of primordial wisdom. Sure they are. Valerie winces. Could we please skip the theological debate over which cult has better orgies? <laughs> I'm not impressed by your attempts to wound my pride. The priestess says nothing, her eyes filled with contempt. Well, enough about that. Tell me who you are, quick now. I am the priestess, the priestess of the cult of Lamashtu, the great mother, the, the ancestress of monsters. The priestess struggles to raise her chin, her voice a hiss. I am not from these lands. I came because of the pleas of your people who seek the mercy of my goddess. I came to these lands in secret and hid my identity from everyone except those in the initiated in the mysteries of the Great Mother. Even the hostess of this lodge had no idea who I was, and those looking for divine benefaction found me on their own. And there are more than the follow there are more than the followers of Arasal would believe. Well then why didn't you just freaking come to the barony and talk to me? I'm not against having other faiths here. It's just when you act suspicious and attack people. Look, we tried to corner your cultists because we believed there was something involved with some of the problems here. It didn't have to turn into a fight, but you guys attacked first. And you ran away. Instead of talking, you ran away.
Keston, I have an order for you. Your grace? Christian, please be more merciful to these people. Imagine how great their despair must be to turn to the monstrous Lamashtu for help. Though the thought disgusts me, the priestess did try to help them in whatever way she could. Yes, and then she tried to run away instead of just telling me what the what's going on. Look, I am merciful. And I respect people's faiths. You just gotta be more open, people. You wanna set up a temple to Lamashtu? I'm totally down with that. I am totally down for people to worship how they want so long as they're not hurting people. That's all I care about when it comes to faith. Valerie folds her hands across her chest and looks at you with interest. The, pe the priestess's guilt is obvious to me. The other is not so much. Her guilt? For what? She hasn't... Okay. So she ran away when the others attacked us. So, I mean, I guess she's not actually guilty of anything. It would be chaotic evil of me to let her go. Oh, oh, it could also be chaotic good and let her go. I forgive all these people, even the priestess. Let them go. Keston looks at you as if you're mad. Let them go, all of them, but as you command your grace. Christine looks at you gratefully. I don't think the Stolen Lands have ever seen someone as kind and noble as you. Valerie looks at you like you just grew a new set of horns. Nice. Then she rolls her eyes and silently turns away. Sana blinks and sweeps her eyes over you as if not just noticing your presence. Well then, it seems I shall serve the Great Mother in these lands a little longer. If, we sh if you wish to speak or ask for something, come to the Shrine of Lamashtu. That is where you'll find me. Keston throws a tired look over the lodge and rubs his chin. That's all. He looks around the lodge. Well, deal with these people as as you've ordered. I suppose it'll be a relief to Dumra to get rid of such troubling guests. I thank you, Your Grace, for your help and your wisdom. A pity we didn't discover the true reason behind the blight. But at least we have one less mystery on our hands. Have a safe journey, my Baron. Can I can keep this pose. I need inspiration. <laughs> All right, let's apologize to Doomra. Um, apparently that's not something I can do. Oh, well. All right, guys, let's go home. Valerie, you need to be stopped being so high and mighty about things. Alright, let's get back to Cerulea. Um. The throne room is full of people. Your allies stand around the throne, waiting in silence as you approach. 
The atmosphere is tense. Today you'll be discussing the strange and deadly blight that's recently struck the bar your barony. Knock knock. The gloomy silence is only penetrated by loud chewing. Knock knock has grabbed a whole fried chicken from the table and is busily busily devouring it, ignoring everyone else completely. Who fries a chicken whole? I'll have to have a word with my servants. Jod folds his hands on his chest. Well, now that we're all here, let's sum up what we know. We've each spent a lot of time and effort to learn what we can, can about where the monsters came from and what's causing this strange disease. I hope this conversation can help sh shed some light on the situation. Keston shakes his head slowly. We need to hurry. If we don't find the source of this blight and eliminate it, we may end up with a rebellion on our hands. Can we keep people calm, persuade them to wait a bit longer? Keston frowns. Your Grace, it's hard to expect loyalty and obedience from people in times like this. They're looking for something or someone to blame. I didn't want to be the one to say it, but... <clears throat> Jod cuts Keston off with a gesture. People think you're cursed, Your Grace, and it would be in your own best interest to quickly discover the cause of, this, of the disaster that keeps claiming the lives of your subjects. All right, Jod, how did you come about these rumors of a curse? Each day I see dozens of infected, Your Grace. Many people have lost their loved ones or fear they soon will. They all want to know what's going on. Who deserves the blame? Whose sins brought this blight upon them? Trust me, every day the number of people willing to pin the blame on you grows. They say you and your barony are cursed. Of course, I don't believe a word of it. This isn't a curse, but some disease, which has somehow manifested itself in your barony. Trust me, I won't leave you until I find the source of this disease, regardless of what these poor people may say in their delirium. Alright, Keston, are you still with the militia? The guard hesitates, furrowing his brow. Your Grace, I understand these people very well. They're tired of just waiting and hoping, but for now I can guide their I can guide their eagerness for action in a positive direction. <clears throat> I'm glad to help them avoid hasty decisions that could cause more trouble. At the same time, I'm convinced that a crowd of terrified villagers who've armed themselves can't truly be our salvation. This barony has a chance only so long as its authorities, as it has authorities and laws. My top priority is helping you remain that authority and that law. Keston takes a deep breath and after the unusually long speech. I just wanted to assure you that I'm on your side. <clears throat> Alright, let's summarize what we found up to this point. Jod, the surgery showed that it was magic seeds causing the disease, correct? Right. Judging from the location on the patient's bodies, these seeds were ingested. It seems likely that, that they're initially extremely small, almost invisible, and people simply swallow them with their food. Once the seed is in the stomach, it begins to grow and cause the symptoms we've seen in our patients. As soon as the seed gains enough strength, it sprouts and turns into a magic portal. Just like a bud turning into a flower. Arastal, forgive me. Jod stares into the distance a moment. Something must have possessed me to say that. It really does look like blooming. Each seed tears the body of its victim, just as ta flowers tear... Just as a flower tears its bud. Can you tell me where these monsters come from, Tristian? The ones that appear because of this bloom. Tristian raises his eyes from the paper on the table, undoubtedly from some world alien to our own. All the monsters appearing from the bloom are exceptionally strong, large and strong. It would be rare to encounter such specimens in the Stolen Lands, or even in most of Galar Galarian. But it's impossible to say what it is that lies on the other side of these portals that's intent on killing your people. Keston, we've discovered that Lamashtu cultists weren't involved in the monster infestation. It doesn't mean they're innocent of other crimes, but the monster invasion at least is not their work. Hearing the name Lamashtu draws Nook Nook's attention. Mother is not to blame here, I told you, but who listens to me? 
All right, well, you got any insight, Knock Knock? Um, goblins obviously like having all the monsters around. To them, it's like a sign of Lamashtu's benevolence. Keston grunts. I'd say they're just excited by anything new that happens. I wouldn't be surprised if they're linked to the story somehow, but I doubt the seeds were created by goblin shamans. Besides, a plan like this seems a little beyond the local goblin chief's intelligence. Knuck Knuck raises his head. Know what I think? I think Goblin King is rotten like scratcher. Shaman plays him like reed pipe, babbles about Lamashtu, then plots behind his back. Alright, so we need to go after the Goblin Shaman. Got it. That's all I need to know about the results of the research. So the bloom's essential properties are strange seeds growing and in, getting into people's bodies, which cause their which causes their disease and eventually creates magical portals. Now we just need to discover where the seeds are coming from. Christian, who'd been examining the map on the tables from the shadows, gives a small cough. If I may, I've noticed an interesting detail. Well, two details, to be precise. First, the seeds afflict mostly the villagers. There have been no recorded cases of disease within the city limits, except for those who came here looking for the cure. Jod nods, that's right. Thus, we can assume a common factor in how people are exposed to the seeds. Many villagers get their food from the same territory. Christian slowly shakes his head. I don't think food is the problem. Take a look. He points at the map. We have the most cases of the disease here, here, and over here. Monsters mostly attack here and here. The cleric's finger travels down the map, tapping points along a fluid line. You see, the situation is most dire. Is most dire along the banks of the Gudrin River. Everyone examines the map closely. A rascal have mercy, Jod. Exhale slowly, exactly, along the river. That must be where the seeds come from, from the drink, their drinking water. Keston, the militia most often finds monsters by the river, right? Hmm. We used to think the monsters were just coming to the river to drink. Keston rubs his forehead. But if what the cleric says is right... Alright, we have to go upstream and find the source of this blight. Knock, knock, jumps at your words. Take me, t me. The goblin bears his sharp, crooked teeth. I want to settle the score with the king. Keston, sh Keston straighten up and flexes his shoulders. If you allow me, Baron, I'd like to take the lead on this. I'll take the best members of the militia with me and sweep the woods along the river. We'll look under every, each and every rock if needed. After everything we've been through, these people deserve a chance to discover the source of their misfortunes. No, Keston, we have to deal with this carefully and rationally. Go to your people and await my arrival. Yet here's the thing, if I'm the one who's seen as cursed, I need to be the one to do something about the curse. Those rumors of me being cursed won't go away if you and the militia take care of things. If, on, if anything, then uh, the next time there's a problem, you'll be the rallying point for discontented citizens. And whether you like it or not, people will try to replace me with you. So, yeah. Heston casts his eyes down. You, you're right, of course, Your Grace. I'll order my men to get ready immediately. We'll await your arrival and then make our move. Tristan how, Tristan, how did you find the link between the disease and the river? You see, Baron, these seeds are not the only sign of something. Abnormal at work. Remember the ruins where we first met? The glade near those ruins, full of huge flowers? Glades such as that tend to appear all over the stolen lands. <clears throat> Seems strange, does it not? Especially if we take into account that the magic seeds and the portals they create look like flowers themselves. Jod even called this disaster the bloom. I'd like to research this natural phenomenon, and perhaps... Tristian stops talking as loud hasty steps are heard from the main entrance. Your grace, we have trouble. The peasants are rioting. Ugh, that's the only solution these nitwits could come up with. 
Don't worry, Baron. As long as they're not setting fires in the setting fire to the streets, we have a chance to coming. We have a chance of coming to a peaceful resolution. If you allow me, I'll go and speak with them. Do my best to calm the crowd down. Okay, please tell me we're not making flammable streets. Because that'd be really silly. If anything, it looks like most of our pathways and such are dirt. So, I mean, unless they're like oiling the streets first or something, then our streets should not be flammable. Kestin Garris. And if peace doesn't prevail, your guards and I will stand with you. Let's go. I can hear their shouting even from here. The murmuring crowds takes up almost the entire square. The murmuring turns to shouts at your arrival, and a stone flies out of the crowd and strikes the cobbles at your feet. There's no cobbles at my feet. We don't have cobbled roads. There are some stray boards on the ground, and grass where I'm standing. No cobbles. Angry peasant. There he is, out at last. Damn his eyes. Please hear me out before you lynch me. I know you're tired and disgruntled. I am too. Day after day, I and my companions seek a solution to your misfortunes. We've saved so many from this fatal disease, and if the gods have mercy, we can save even more. So please, let us do what we can. Return to your homes, to your loved ones. They need you, just as I need your patience and good faith. The crowd before you sways and mumbles. People look at one another, talk in a hushed tone, shake their heads and frown. It seems rebels who were screaming and jeering a minute ago lost all their confidence. Finally, one of the peasants opens his mouth. The Baron is right. Angry peasant, you really believe this? It's pure nonsense. Don't you get it? We could run the Baron through, but it wouldn't change a thing. He's of more use alive than dead. So be it, Baron. We'll let you pass. But don't forget, we're trusting you with our lives. Find the source. Save our children from this terrible sickness. That's what I'm trying to do. You guys are delaying that. Oh my god, really? Amiri looks unusually grim today. Listen, we need to talk, but not in front of everyone. After the council ends, come to the tavern. It's about my tribe, my old one from before. Okay, fine, Amiri. We'll do that. Rigongar, listen, I'm tired of hearing about bandits and thieves. My job is managing the army, not chasing pickpockets. Hire a warden, let him drill the guards, and make sure your subjects don't take too much trouble. Make too much trouble, sorry. Rigongar shakes his head fiercely. Fine, so why did I come here? Ah, right, I was thinking. Your soldiers need to sleep somewhere. It's time we build a barracks. I've brought a map. Can you show me where you want it? We've built a barracks. I'm 100% sure I already built a barracks in the capital. An unkind smile shows up on Rigongar's face. Of course, I'd build them right on the border. Your neighbors are restless and we need to show them we're serious. Some troops in their face is, a seri is serious all right. No, we'll place training camps nearby the capital. Gongar growls annoyed. Maybe we'll re requisition some fluffy blankets, too. Soldiers should learn to fight the enemy, not beat up wooden dummies. Soldiers should be stationed centrally so they can respond to things. You put the barracks near one border, and then the problem will be at the opposite border. And they'll be too slow to stop the capital from getting ransacked. 
Think, Rigongar. Think. We do not have a large enough army to maintain garrisons near the borders. Once we've grown enough, once people stop exploding into monsters, then maybe that's something we can work on. Right now, we need the army around and present to keep the peace. Oh my god, Harem wants something now too? Oh no, it's... It's Dragon. Dragon bows from the waist and addresses you ceremoniously. Greetings, Your Grace. By tradition, if a worthy ruler is patron to a master, the master gives generously in return. I have come to honor this tradition. Please accept this. I worked hard on it and I hope it serves you well. Received item, Ankle Breaker. Alright, thank you for your gift. It's a pleasure to work hard for such an honorable lord. Okay, what's Ankle Breaker? Because I know I asked you for something specific, but... Okay. There we go. Let me check the inventory real quick. Oh, it is... Okay, Ankle Breaker is a crossbow. Slow down. This plus one crossbow has a chance to slow the enemy on hit. But it's only enhancement plus one. Whereas Miri, I mean, Lindsay's already got a plus two. Dang it, I was trying to get her a better crossbow, but whatever. Um, that can be Tristian's new backup weapon. All right, and that's going to finally be it for today. Sorry for the long episode. I didn't realize I was going to get drawn into so many things as soon as we got back to the capital. Thank you for um, watching. This has been Pathfinder Kingmaker, the Chronicle of Arius Cyril, and I am some guy you've never heard of. Unless, of course, you have.